Uh, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Richard Klein. I'm a uh, member of the board of PPMD, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next, next group of speakers. And uh, so this last panel was very concentrated on the promise and the challenges of developing these new kinds of therapies. Uh, my career was spent at FDA. I'm kind of astounded by gene therapy, and to me it is an amazing uh, change of, of paradigm of how diseases, particularly rare diseases, may be treated in the very near future, and we're already seeing successes. Uh, but obviously, as the last panel pointed out, there are still quite a few challenges, quite a few unknowns. Uh, so we have the uh, privilege of hearing from three companies who are actively involved in development of these gene therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, I think uh, you know my, my career at FDA has certainly taught me that this is a very competitive market, but uh, I think for our community, it's very important that all three of these products become successful and enter the market and give people different options. So what I would like to do is introduce the, uh, the speakers, uh, and I hope uh, I have the correct uh, pronunciation, Genevieve Lefebvreet uh, from Solid. Uh, Michael Binks from Pfizer and Doug Ingram from Sarepta, in that order, are going to talk about the development uh, that they are engaged in. Each of the speakers will take about 20 minutes to talk, and we're going to hold questions until the end so that all, all three speakers can, uh, can work together to respond to questions. And again, we want to limit questions to families uh, when we do that. So without further ado, I would like to introduce... Genevieve. For your introduction. Again, my name is Genevieve LaFourette. I'm a Vice President of Clinical Research and Development at Solid Biosciences. I'd really like to thank Pat. Better? Better. Better? Okay. I'd really like to thank Pat and all everyone at PPMD for the opportunity um, to participate in this absolutely fantastic conference. Today, it's my great uh, pleasure and privilege to talk with you about SOLID's SGT001 microdystrophin gene therapy program for Duchenne. So before going any further, let me see, I have a slide driver. Because SOLID is a publicly traded company, I'm required to show this disclaimer about forward-looking statements that will be part of today's talk. It's compelling reading, but I only have 20 minutes, so I'm going to move on from there. Um, but in those 20 minutes, um, I'd like to provide an, an introduction to our company, to those of you who might not be familiar with, with SOLID, and then give a bit of background, again, on dystrophin protein. I know this has been discussed in other sessions, but it never hurts to have a bit of a refresh. Then talk generally about gene transfer uh, for the treatment of Duchenne, and then get into the specifics about SGT001, our microdystrophin gene therapy program, and the IGNITE DMD clinical trial. And then shifting gears a little bit uh, to talk about SGT001 manufacturing, because that was raised in earlier sessions as an important consideration and challenge to get treatment out to pa patients. So to kick things off, I have a very brief video uh, to show you a little bit about SOLID, how it started, and what we're all about. My son was diagnosed with Duchenne when he was two and a half years old. And at the time of diagnosis, there was nothing we could give him that would change the course of the disease. It was a terrible time, and Annie and I, over the next days and weeks and months, started thinking maybe there's something we can do to make things different for my son and for many other kids with this disease. And it led to many important things in our lives. One of them is solid. And so at solid, we are focused on one disease. We're totally agnostic to how we solve it. We don't get confused or distracted by other problems. We have this one big problem and we need to fix it. Typically, you might be focused on a technology, a platform, but for us, being focused on a specific disease gives us the ability to really hone in on the different symptoms. It allows us an opportunity to uh, spread our wings into different modalities and really so uh, be agnostic to the approach taken. So for us, it means that we will look at anything and everything that could uh, show positive benefit for Duchenne. 
We operate kind of in two different ways. While we all have that kind of business clock that we're working on, we're also working on a, a very personal clock. The biggest motivator for Solid is the patients. They're in our hearts, they're in our mind. They work with us, they visit us. I got one at home. We live in a world where DMD is a terrible disease to have. And our job and passion is to change that. I think solid strength in science and in our goals in general really comes from our connection with the community, both the founders of the company and their son, as well as how focused we are on the patient population. Most of the time, experiments fail or you're, you don't get the answer that you were thinking. And so for us, being able to meet the patients and know the families, it's, it gives us that motivation. We'll try again. Let's ask the question a different way. Let's do it again. As CSO and, and, and being heavily involved in the, the patient community, I do have that emotional connection. I think it forces a, you to drive and, and push harder when you know that, that uh, people you've met at conferences, the parents are asking about their boy and, and what's gonna happen, it, it pushes you forward. I feel so privileged that I get to get out of bed every day and come to a place of work where everybody is working passionately and with urgency to change the course of this disease. SOLID exists because Duchenne should not exist. SOLID is here to be a beacon and to be a light for every family living with this disease and for every scientist to come to with great science, for clinicians to know that SOLID is here because we genuinely care about patients and their families and that the trust and the motivation is without question. So it's really hard to say more about SOLID than what's already been shown in the video, but i just like to emphasize a, a few key points. At SOLID, uniquely, we are focused 100% on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we really take a 360-degree approach um, to address all facets of the disease. Our mission is to develop meaningful therapies to address all patients with Duchenne. Our lead program, SGT001, um, for microdystrophin gene therapy, is based on decades of Duchenne research. In addition, as I alluded to before, because of the significant challenges in manufacturing to meet the needs of all Duchenne patients, our team of in-house scientists has developed a manufacturing process that meets all of our clinical trial needs currently and can scale up to support future commercial supply. So we're focusing and addressing Duchenne across four different areas. Firstly, corrective therapies that can address the underlying genetic cause of Duchenne, namely mutations in the dystrophin gene. So our lead uh, gene therapy candidate, SGT001, is part of this program. But we're also doing work in so-called disease-modifying therapies. This is where we work to address the various disease mechanisms that are associated with progression of Duchenne. Uh, such as muscle fibrosis, that is the buildup of scar tissue within the muscle, damaged muscle, um, inflammation, and others. And these are intended to complement our corrective therapies. And then because declining mobility is such a hallmark of Duchenne, we're also developing assistive devices intended to help patients perform their daily activities. And last but not least, because everything we do is focused on Duchenne, we're always seeking to deepen our understanding of the disease, to develop biomarkers and measurement tools to help us and others in the field better develop uh, meaningful therapies. So before I get into the topic of gene therapy for Duchenne, I thought it might be helpful to provide some basic background about dystrophin, the protein that's missing in, in DMD. So again, this will be a bit of a repeat, but we'll set the stage for what we talk about. So what does dystrophin do? Um, as was discussed by Dr. Nelson yesterday, and you may have heard uh, before that, um, in a healthy muscle, uh, the dystrophin gene provides the instructions for making dystrophin protein, uh, shown here, oops, I need to go, shown here in red, in the middle. Um, it plays a critical role in protecting the mus muscle from cell damage, and it does this in, in multiple ways. Dystrophin uh, connects the moving parts inside the muscle cell with proteins in the membrane. The membrane is the wrapping around the muscle cell, and it acts like a kind of shock absorber that buffers the membrane against mechanical damage as the muscle contracts and relaxes. So lots of mechanical stress, wear and tear. 
Dystrophin also binds and stabilizes proteins at or near the membrane, and these play a key role in uh, muscle health and function. And a particularly important protein in this regard is neuronal nitric oxide synthase, or known as NNOS, that's responsible for increasing blood flow to muscles during exercise to meet uh, the increased metabolic demand. So in Duchenne, Mutations or errors in the dystrophin gene redu redu uh, sorry, result in an inability to produce functional dystrophin protein. And you can see how that protein is missing in the middle of the, of the diagram. So without dystrophin, there's no shock absorber to buffer against mechanical stress. And the ability to keep important pro protective proteins like NNOS in place at the membrane is lost. So the absence of NNOS impairs muscles' ability to get enough oxygen and nutrients when they need them. And over time, this accumulates uh, damage um, that overwhelms the ability of muscles to repair or to be renewed. And ultimately, muscle fibers deteriorate and die. And they're replaced by fat and scar tissue, so-called fibrosis. So the idea behind gene transfer for Duchenne is to deliver a new gene to muscle cells with instructions for making a working form of dystrophin protein. This new form of dystrophin is designed to replace the function of the original dystrophin that was, should have been there, and thus rescue the health and the integrity of the muscle. So this new form of dystrophin, so-called microdystrophin, is shown here in green. It's different from the dystrophin that's made in healthy muscles, and I'll explain that further in a moment. So at this point, let me start with a bit of general background about gene transfer for Duchenne, then turn to an overview of SOLID's lead program for microdystrophin gene transfer, SGT001. So as mentioned, the idea behind gene transfer is to get a new version of the gene that carries the proper instructions for making a working protein and get that into every affected cell in the body. So this needs three components. One is naturally the gene itself, but another important component is the so-called promoter. And this is the kind of ignition key, if you will, to turn on the gene in the right place. And then finally, you need a way to carry the gene and the promoter uh, to the cells where they need to go. And currently, as was extensively uh, discussed in the earlier session, the best way to do this is to put the gene and the promoter into a modified virus. The business of viruses is to attach to cells in the body, infect them with the DNA that the virus carries. But fortunately, as we heard about AAV, not all viruses cause illness, and they can be altered uh, intentionally to carry the DNA that you want to deliver to cells. So again, as discussed before, the current virus of choice for gene transfer is adeno-associated virus, or AAV. It's not known to cause disease in humans, and it's been modified so it can't reproduce inside the body. All it does is carry the gene and the promoter and deliver it to cells. So also, as mentioned, there are different types of AAV that have a preference for going to certain kinds of organs, certain kinds of tissues within the body. And for Duchenne, AAV9 is used often because it has a preference for going to muscle cells, and it's been extensively studied and has been used in other gene transfer clinical trials. So what are the components in SGT001 specifically? First of all, it contains a unique gene that carries the instructions for making this new protein to replace missing dystrophin. I'll get into the details of, of what that protein consists of in a moment. It also contains a promoter that drives uh, protein production just in skeletal and heart muscle. Um, and also, um, so before going on, I wanted to make a kind of an analogy uh, to help explain how a promoter drives the production of the protein just in certain tissues. So imagine that this whole gene transfer package is like a message in, the bo in a bottle. The AAV9 is the bottle, and the transgene and the promoter, that's the message inside the bottle. So say you release a thousand bottles with the same message written in Spanish into the ocean. So the ocean currents are going to take it all over the world, and it'll wash up on beaches everywhere in many different countries. But it'll only be able to be read and interpreted if it lands in a Spanish-speaking country. So the vector we use, AAV9, the bottle, prefers skeletal and heart muscle, but can go to organs all over the body. But it's the promoter that makes the information only be read and acted on in skeletal and heart muscle. So now turning to some of the details about our SGT001 gene. 
as was talked about before also, the challenge faced by all of us working in the uh, gene transfer space for Duchenne is the extraordinarily large size of the dystrophin gene. It's the largest gene in the human body. However, the carrying capacity of AAV is very, very limited. So the strategy um, that we have used and others in the field to overcome this challenge is to rationally design an abridged version of the dystrophin gene, so-called microdystrophin, that will fit into AAV, but still carry the instructions for making a smaller version that contains regions, the regions that are important for function. So designing our SGT001 microdystrophin gene was very involved because the dystrophin gene is very complex. So as you can see in the top illustration here, dystrophin protein is made up of many different parts or so-called domains that carry out different aspects of dystrophin's function. You may also notice that there are a lot of segments that are repeated many times along the length of the protein. So that suggests that there may be some redundancy that can be taken advantage of and that the protein can be pared down just to the essential elements that are required for function. We selected the components of SGT001 based on more than 30 years of research in Duchenne biology, and we confirmed that selection based on experiments comparing different versions of, the, of microdystrophins. Of note, we included a really important uh, component of dystrophin that's critical for it to work properly, which I described before, the NNOS binding domain. As we discussed, one of the dystrophin's jobs is to hold NNOS, um, that's so important for muscle health, right where it should be, near the uh, muscle cell membrane. So how did these design elements of SGT001 perform when they were studied uh, in animals? The next couple of slides show how the SGT001 promoter indeed drives microdystrophin expression selectively in muscle, and the presence of the NNOS binding domain is critical uh, for the function of SGT001 microdystrophin. So this study in a large animal model of Duchenne, a DMD dog model, um, shows how this muscle-specific CK8 promoter that we use in SGT001 effectively restricts expression to target muscle tissues. It's a bit of a complex slide, but if you focus first on the two images on the left, the two bands on the right of each image show that there is strong expression of microdystrophin, strong production of this protein in the diaphragm, the large muscle in the chest involved in uh, breathing, and also the vastus lateralis, which is a leg muscle. Contrast that with what you see on the right, where you don't see expression in non-muscle tissue, in this case, the liver. It's pr very important because the liver likes to sponge up lots of AAV, um, but we want microdystrophin itself to be made only where it's needed for healthy muscle tissue, uh, for healthy muscle function. And so these results demonstrate that this is what happens. So here we show the importance of the NNOS binding domain in the function of SGT001 microdystrophin. In this experiment, MDX mice, they're a mouse, an animal model of Duchenne, were treated with two different versions of microdystrophin. One was SGT001 that contains the NNOS binding domain, and the other was a different version without this domain. And the strength of the animal's diaphragm, again, this very important large muscle that controls breathing, was uh, assessed six months after treatment. So the black bar on the left shows the kind of strength that you would see in healthy mice. The white bar next to it shows how untreated MDX mice have much lower diaphragm strength than healthy mice. The teal bar in the middle shows that treatment with SGT001 that contains the NNOS binding domain improves diaphragm strength uh, to that of healthy mice. And the gray bar on the right uh, shows less improvement in MDX mice treated with a non-NNOS version of microdystrophin. So by including this NNOS binding domain in our transgene, in our version of microdystrophin, we achieved force generation comparable to what's seen in healthy mice. Okay, thank you. So a very important other uh, element we talked about was durability. In the interest of time, I'm going to talk about this very quickly. You can see from the slide, though, if you look out in dogs um, expressing microdystrophin, that we see persistent expression without any notable reduction um, with our microdystrophin um, over a two and a half year period. 
So moving very quickly. Um, so all of these data and uh, the strength of our design uh, led us into the clinic with our Ignite DMD uh, trial, which was initiated in November 2017. We treated our first patient in February 2018. So important and unique aspect of this study is our commitment to uh, addressing the needs of all patients across the different ages and stages of Duchenne. So from the very beginning, the study was designed to include two age groups, both ambulatory children and non-ambulatory adolescents. Indeed, our first dose subject, our dose patient, was a, a, a teenager uh, who was uh, non-ambulatory. And also, we took a very uh, standard stepwise dose escalation approach in the design to our study. This is intended to start at a lower dose to assess the safety, assess the efficacy, review those data, and then see if there's uh, an impetus to move on to a, a higher uh, dose. Um, we also designed this as a randomized controlled study in which uh, non-treated patients are followed along in parallel with treated patients initially, but after a year, those ones untreated then are eligible to get treatment. Um, so everybody gets treated in the study. Um, there's a one-year delay for, for some of the patients. Um, so the primary purpose of the study was to look at safety and, and um, as a really the key parameter, but also to look at microdystrophin expression in muscle. We also are collecting a variety of functional endpoints, real world endpoints, imaging, uh, biochemical biomarkers. This is really an, a, a, an opportunity to collect a lot of uh, relevant data about how SGT001 is, is uh, acting in, in, in patients. So very quickly through this uh, current sli slide about the current study status of Ignite DMD. So in February, uh, the data from the first three subjects treated with our starting dose showed microdystrophin production that, along with the results from our animal studies, uh, suggested that higher levels could be achieved uh, with an increased dose. So after careful review of all of the data, we consulted with our data safety monitoring board, who is an independent board that advises us um, and, and uh, also helps uh, monitor patients' best interests. We moved forward with increasing the dose fourfold as planned. This was all planned in the dose escalation design of the study. And higher dosing uh, began in patients in March 2019. So the first patient dosed um, at this higher dose had some safety events that were ably managed by Dr. Byrne and the medical team at University of Florida. The patient fully recovered, returned to his normal activities, went to school, presumably now enjoying his summer vacation, and all the uh, patients dosed in the study are currently doing well. <laughs> We're continuing to expand our clinical activities for the 2E14, the higher dose, and are fortunate to have Dr. Brenda Wong at University of Massachusetts and Dr. Nancy Kuntz and Vamshi Rao of Lurie Children's in Chicago soon to join University of Florida as study sites for Ignite DMD. So we're really very hopeful that results from muscle biopsies, and there's my ring, um, from patients treated at this dose um, will show increased microdystrophin expression, and we look forward to sharing data with the community later, later this year. So in the interest of time, can I at least do my thank yous at the end? Great, thank you. So I'll skip over manufacturing, but we're developing great scale up. Um, so to wrap up, we're very excited, we're really optimistic about the promise of SGT001, really to provide meaningful benefit in the lives of patients across the disease spectrum, and also our ability to supply a, a drug for patient needs. So I'd like to close, and really importantly, uh, to express our deep appreciation to the patients and families in our study, uh, to PPMD for the opportunity to speak with you today, uh, to the amazing team at SOLID, and to you for your attention. And I look forward to any questions at our session in a few minutes. Thank you. So we'd like to uh, introduce Michael Binks, who represents Pfizer. Thanks very much, Richard. <clears throat> so it's a great, great pleasure to uh, be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we'd like to uh, share with you some initial data from our phase one safety study uh, of our gene therapy in, in Duchenne. In addition to thanking uh, you all for listening, um, I did want to thank the DMD team at, uh, at Pfizer. So we've been working in this area for the last five years. Uh, through uh, the, the Domagrosumab program and now uh, with this gene therapy program. And they were all very keen that we were uh, able to break precedent uh, in terms of 
uh, what we normally do in terms of disclosing early data so that uh, you are able to uh, see this information early on uh, and uh, figure it into your decision-making processes uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm a Pfizer employee, and uh, uh, I need to show this uh, disclaimer. So uh, we've been investing in gene therapy for the last three or four years. This is now our third clinical gene therapy program. We have uh, two programs in hemophilia and uh, this one, and we're making substantial investments in uh, AAV technology uh, to, uh, to make uh, uh, incremental improvements. Uh, and eventually to bring real breakthroughs forward to rare disease patients. The focus is on uh, adeno-associated virus, and uh, we're making very substantial investments in the manufacturing uh, technology. The uh, uh, drug or compound that we're talking about is PF0693-9926. Uh, now, this originated uh, through uh, academic research at the University of North Carolina and was really in invented by uh, Professor Zhao Zhao and Jude Samulski at University of North Carolina. Uh, and it came to Pfizer through the acquisition of Bamboo Therapeutics in 2016. The uh, vector uses the AAV9 capsid. Uh, and uh, a, a slightly different uh, mini dystrophin, truncated dystrophin, uh, than uh, the other uh, projects. Uh, but it, it in, inclu incorporates five of these spectrin like repeats and uh, hinge regions one, three, and four. Uh, we're using a human muscle specific uh, promoter to drive expression. So we've talked about the preclinical data that we, has been generated with this vector uh, previously, so I don't want to dwell on it, but we use that data to justify to the regulators uh, and to talk to uh, many patient advocacy groups uh, about the design of our phase one study uh, and, and gained an awful lot of information uh, about uh, many different aspects of of uh, the disease and the context in which we were uh, moving this uh, drug. So our design is essentially uh, based on uh, a dose escalation. Uh, we uh, plan to dose six boys in, uh, at a lower dose and uh, six boys at a higher dose. We're presenting uh, just data from the first six boys, uh, three of uh, the, whom were dosed at the lower dose and three at the higher dose today. The uh, study involves uh, <coughs> uh, three muscle biopsies at baseline after two months and after 12 months of treatment. We're treating uh, a population of boys in the age range of five to 12 years. They need to be still uh, walking and they need to be on uh, a steady uh, a, a dose, of, dose of daily glucocorticoids. And they need to be negative for uh, 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 an antibody test for neutralizing antibodies to AAV9. The treatment itself is a, an intravenous infusion, lasts about two hours. The boys are kept in hospital for 24 hours and then allowed to go home and have frequent clinic visits over the weeks following uh, the treatment. The primary endpoint and focus for us is safety, but we're also measuring uh, mini dystrophin expression in muscle biopsies, biopsies taken from the, the biceps muscle, um, and, uh, and various biomarkers, functional uh, measures, and uh, activity monitoring as exploratory endpoints. So as I said, we've tra treated six boys. Uh, in terms of the screening, uh, I think we've screened 11. Uh, and we've had, in those 11, a single case of a positive neutralizing antibody uh, that, that was exclusionary. Well, I'll just... Uh, our three uh, clinical trial sites are uh, Duke University with Eddie Smith at UCLA uh, with Perry Shea and in the University of Utah uh, with Russell Butterfield. I should say, though, that all recruitment for this study is fully subscribed, uh, and really we, there, there aren't opportunities for uh, further uh, recruitment. 
So I want to talk about uh, the safety so far. Uh, and this is our listing of adverse drug reactions that's now incorporated into our investigator brochure. Um, as you can see, there's a fairly high frequency of gastrointestinal uh, 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 symptoms, uh, often associated with uh, anorexia, so nausea and vomiting associated with anorexia and, and lethargy or fatigue, uh, and occasionally a fever. Uh, I'll talk about the GI uh, effects in a moment, uh, but we have had one case of an acute kidney injury, and I'll tell you about the details of that in a few moments. So in terms of the GI symptoms, I think uh, Professor Byrne described that these were common across uh, AAV studies. Uh, we've seen uh, nausea and vomiting uh, in uh, two-thirds of the patients. Uh, the vomiting usually resolves within a week, uh, nausea in a, um, perhaps it takes a little longer to resolve. We've generally managed to manage this with oral anti-emetics, anti-sickness medicines. Um, but we did have one participant who uh, went home and w was still vomiting and required readmission to hospital for a couple of days for intravenous fluids to rehydrate him uh, and before he could uh, go home. His symptoms resolved completely over uh, several weeks. After uh, that event, which is classified as a serious adverse event because it required admission to hospital, uh, we've made some uh, modifications to the protocol, particularly relating to uh, antiemetic use and uh, fluid, uh, 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 fluid uh, intake uh, to, to try and avoid this uh, happening again. The second uh, uh, more serious adverse event uh, was related to uh, an acute renal injury, which was associated with evidence of complement activation. So the, the boy in question uh, was qu quite well clinically uh, after one week, certainly nothing uh, very much outside of what we'd seen for other, other boys. Uh, and he presented for his two-week uh, checkup um, uh, without, without symptoms, uh, but with quite marked laboratory abnormalities in his uh, blood tests, particularly related to renal function. So his creatinine, uh, urea nitrogen uh, were uh, elevated. He had elevated levels of uric acid in his, in his blood. In, a, in addition, there was some evidence of hemolysis. Uh, so that's uh, where red cells are damaged um, uh, with uh, low haptoglobins and evidence of complement activation. Complement is a, 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 an inflammatory amplifier mechanism uh, that's used in, in your, by your immune system to defend against bacteria. Uh, with uh, reduced levels of C3 and elevated levels of the terminal phase of complement C5B to 9. So this boy was admitted to a pediatric intensive care unit uh, the same day. He was monitored uh, very closely. It emerged that he hadn't been producing very much urine over the previous two days, but uh, hadn't uh, mentioned this uh, to his parents. Um, and uh, the clinical diagnosis on the basis of the laboratory test was uh, one of suspected complement-mediated nephropathy which looked very much like an atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a, 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 a rare uh, syndrome that uh, nephrologists are very familiar with. What was slightly unusual about this case was that he remained really quite well uh, through, through the process. Normally with atypical uh, HUS, uh, uh, individuals are, are severely unwell uh, in addition to uh, their impaired renal function. So, uh, in order to respond to this and manage this uh, situation, uh, he was hemodialyzed uh, over a two-week period and treated with a complement inhibitor, eculizumab, uh, on two occasions. By uh, t 11 days after admission, he, his urine output had uh, re resumed to uh, reasonable levels and his uh, renal function had returned completely to normal. His platelet count, which had been reduced at the point of admission, uh, also returned uh, to normal. One observation we made, though, was that the neutralizing antibody levels in this uh, boy were much higher uh, than the rest of the cohort who had been treated 
uh, 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 two weeks later. So uh, it looked as though he had a more rapid, uh, higher uh, antibody response to the vector. So all the boys get an antibody response to the vector. This one was a bit faster um, uh, and a, a bit higher. And we think that's probably what has caused, in this case, uh, the complement activation event uh, to occur. So uh, we've uh, uh, paused the study uh, as required by our protocol uh, to investigate further, to discuss with our external data monitoring committee, and to make changes to our uh, study protocol. Uh, those are now all complete, and we're awaiting final uh, ethics review board approval to resume uh, dosing. The last thing I want to say about safety uh, relates to acute liver injury. I think uh, uh, Professor Byrne again mentioned that, that uh, there was a big concern about uh, inflammation in the liver uh, following AAV treatment, um, <clears throat> uh, following uh, high-dose AAV uh, therapy. And what we were surprised to see with our vector was, in fact, that we couldn't really uh, detect any inflammation in the liver. And that may be due to the high doses of steroids that we're giving, uh, but uh, certainly in terms of uh, conventional testing uh, with gamma GT, uh, there were no deviations from the normal range. Um, but even using the much more sensitive glutamate dehydrogenase test, uh, we had a single deviation uh, from the normal range over a few days um, at the same time as the complement activation event in that, in that individual. So that's very encouraging. And it may mean that we, uh, in the future, will be able to reduce the uh, high steroid dose that's required for co-administration. All right, I want to talk about some of the uh, preliminary uh, results from our secondary and exploratory endpoints. So I'm going to talk about the immunofluorescence and show you some pictures and, uh, and some numbers. Uh, I'm going to sh uh, talk about uh, some data um, measuring uh, using uh, a new method to measure dystrophin concentration in muscle biopsies. Um, and thanks to a number of people who have been working very hard to turn around the, the data, we're able to report on some one-year data uh, with the North Star ambulatory assessment on the first uh, few patients. So just to orient you, I think uh, you can see this despite the lighting in the room. Uh, these are our muscle biopsies. This is from uh, uh, one of the patients in the cohort, uh, in the, the, the high, higher dose cohort. On the left, you'll see a low magnification view with green staining, which is uh, an antibody to laminin, which outlines the uh, sarcolemmal membrane. So these are cross-sectional biopsies of the biceps, just to remember. On the, uh, in the middle panels, you can see uh, uh, without the, the, the laminin staining, just the staining from dystrophin. In the top are the baseline biopsies, in the bottom are the biopsies at two months. And the last panel on the right, uh, you can see high power view of uh, the same uh, cross-sectional biopsy. And I think uh, you can see here that uh, the red uh, circles, which are the fibers expressing dystrophin uh, are, certainly seem to be in the majority. Um, I'll just flick through the other two patients in this high-dose cohort. Uh, we're, we're very encouraged to see uh, these sorts of levels uh, of expression. And the third patient in that high-dose cohort also uh, with uh, very significant uh, numbers of fibers expressing. And in fact, when we quantify uh, th those images using a, a digital image analysis algorithm, um, we're, we're able to uh, automatically uh, uh, count the number of positive fibers. And you can see here uh, the low-dose group and the high-dose group uh, that uh, we were able to achieve 39% uh, of in terms of change from baseline in the number of fibers with the low dose and 69% uh, change from baseline in the uh, high dose group. And the numbers of fibers being transduced is important because uh, it clearly the more fibers that are expressing uh, dystrophin, uh, the more are likely to be able to return to normal function or have longer survival um, in, in the future. So we're very encouraged by uh, this uh, distribution of expression. 
We've been uh, validating a, a new method uh, called uh, immunoaffinity liquid chromatography uh, and mass spectros uh, spectroscopy. Um, this is a, a, a novel assay. I'll tell you a bit more about it in a moment, but this data is from our validation set uh, showing uh, the breadth of uh, d the distribution amongst normal muscle biopsies. So these are 20 uh, pediatric samples of, uh, of muscle um, that uh, we measured individually from uh, normal individuals. And you can see a range from 60% to 150% uh, around a mean uh, there. And equally, you can see a wide distribution in the Becker's population and, uh, and the low levels seen in uh, Duchenne. The one outlier in the Duchenne population turned out to be a boy with a, an in-frame mutation. So from a genetic uh, standpoint, uh, somewhere on the, on the borders of Duchenne and Becker's. So why use LCMS? Well, uh, we felt that this, this was uh, uh, an important step forward in the uh, measurement of dystrophin concentration. Uh, we happen to have a very strong uh, uh, mass spectroscopy group uh, who have been uh, working on this assay for a number of years. We have a recombinant mini dystrophin standard which helps to calibrate. The assay itself has a wide dynamic range, meaning uh, that without modification, it can measure very low levels and very high levels uh, of uh, dystrophin. It's very sensitive, down to uh, approximately 0.5% of normal, and the variability is, is tight. Um, We have, uh, we're able to measure a number of different peptides uh, that reflect either the mini dystrophin itself or full length dystrophin. And, uh, and that's very useful to deconvolute sometimes the high basal uh, expression levels. And lastly, we've had some discussions with the FDA about this and they're very supportive of the development of this assay and agree that it's uh, significantly improved over uh, the Western blot method. So we're excited that we're able to contribute this uh, to the field. We're in the process of preparing a publication of the data. And this is the, the expression data, so we're able to measure concentration in terms of femtomoles of dystrophin per milligram of protein in the muscle biopsy. Uh, and we've seen a range between uh, 300 and 1800 femtomoles uh, across these two cohorts. When we normalize with the, uh, our, our normal dystrophin pool of 20 samples that I described earlier, um, uh, the, the axis on the, on the right uh, shows you that the, the, this is approximates to 24% and 29.5% uh, of normal dystrophin using our normal standard. But you should note that uh, the normal standard, uh, the, the the standards for normal are not universal, and and there is no uh, accepted uh, standard, and it's something I think as a field we need to work to establish. So lastly, I just want to mention the uh, functional data that we've uh, seen in the uh, two boys who have completed 12 months uh, treatment. So remember, this is open label data, uh, so it's confounded by uh, the, the, all the biases of expectation. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it, it's not uh, uh, confounded by glucocorticoid effects as in, in terms of the, the higher dose of glucocorticoids that are given peri-infusion. Uh, and we're, we're pleased to see that relative to uh, natural history here, this is a plot generated by the CTAP consortium based on the UK North Star data that's in press and kindly um, we were given permission to, uh, to use this, where the, uh, the dark line there represents the, the, the uh, uh, modeled uh, means uh, of the population. Uh, and the two uh, uh, red lines uh, represent the change over a one-year period uh, in boys of, of this age group. So these were boys of seven and eight-year-olds. Um, and you can see on the right there the uh, baseline three, six, and 12 month uh, North Star uh, data. So a very uh, uh, important uh, natural history data set uh, that is providing a lot of insights into uh, progression of disease uh, and how that uh, progression changes 
uh, f from the young boys to the older boys. Uh, <coughs> and um, and, and uh, we we're really encouraged by this, but obviously this data is very variable, uh, 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 as is all uh, natural history data in Duchenne, and needs to be taken uh, somewhat with a pinch of salt. But uh, certainly given us sufficient encouragement to want to move uh, forward. So I'll, I'll cut this short. I agree with Professor Byrne. We need to understand the immunology a bit further. Uh, and there's a lot of ongoing research, uh, both internally at Pfizer and uh, in the academic community to understand that uh, further. Our data are, uh, provided a sufficient encouragement uh, to plan a phase three study that we uh, anticipate starting in the first half of next year. Uh, there will be a global randomized placebo controlled study. Uh, and we are scaling up uh, manufacturing. We're already producing at a 2,000 liter scale uh, and anticipate uh, uh, building further bioreactors uh, to su support uh, commercial demand. So these data are, uh, and the data from uh, some more patients that we intend to dose in phase one will help to inform decisions regarding uh, the optimal dose, administration, co-medication, patient selection, safety monitoring uh, for our future studies. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our last speaker, uh, Doug Ingram from Sarepta. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, on to the most important slide. First of all, um, anyone who's spoken to me will know the sincerity that I have when I say what an honor it is to have the opportunity to talk directly to families affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So thank you to PPMD and thank you to Pat Furlong for this opportunity. These are our forward-looking statements. I am going to make predictions about the future probably. Um, there are lots of risks and uncertainties when one has the temerity to make predictions about the future. So please look to our public filings for a list of those risks and uncertainties. If you will indulge me for a moment, this is actually an important personal milestone for me today. It was literally exactly two years to the day ago when uh, Sarepta announced that I would be its chief executive officer. And the process for that actually started a few months previous to that. I was approached a couple of months before that from a couple of board members for Sarepta who asked me if I was interested in becoming the chief executive officer for a company I had never heard of that was attempting to treat a disease I knew very little about and to move to Boston, Massachusetts to do that. At the time, this is where I live. This place is called Newport Beach, California, and if you haven't been there, at least in my mind today, this is exactly what it's like every single day. Now, I was wrong, but this is what I imagined every day in Boston was like, <laughs> all right? So I said, no, absolutely not. And then they persisted, and what they said was, you need to look at this company, and you need to see what they're trying to do to improve the lives of families living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and you need to talk to the employees and see how passionate they are. And I did that, and I did get hooked, and of course I did become the CEO, and it is unquestionably the most meaningful, if not the easiest, at least the most meaningful thing that I'm going to have done in my professional career because Sarepta is on a mission. We are very serious about our mission to improve the lives of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now it may, not, may be the case today, either now or in the Q&A, that I'll make pointed comments. And if I do, you may come away with the wrong impression. But let me be very clear about that. There is no one on this stage that is currently a competitor of Sarepta. I don't consider my colleagues at Pfizer a, a competitor. We all together have only one competitor on this mission, and it is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I'm quite convinced of the fact that they are as committed to improving the lives of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as we are at Sarepta. We take the words on this mission statement very seriously. These are not simply things that sit on our wall. Look at that last paragraph. 
every one of us at Sarepta, and there's about 650 of us today, get up every day trying our best to act with an urgency that matches the urgency that families with Duchenne have every day. That's our goal. We have a lot of different ways that we're attacking Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You will hear tomorrow from our head of research and development, Dr. Gilmore O'Neill, about our RNA platform or exon skipping platform. And you're also going to hear tomorrow from Dr. Charlie Gerspach at Duke University about a very exciting program that we have, a research program around gene editing for Duchenne. We have three gene therapy programs for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and I'm going to talk today about our most advanced program, the microdystrophin program that we originally licensed from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Now, as has been pointed out before, while all of us are working on gene therapy and microdystrophin, there are differences between our programs and they really come down to these three components. I'll try not to repeat what has already been said, but there are differences first in the vector. The vector is the delivery device, this AAV, so we hijack uh, nature, and we've used this viral capsid or vector to deliver a gene. The second important component, and that there are differences between us, is in the promoter. The promoter is very clever. As you know, it is the thing that turns the gene on. It tells the gene where to turn on, and it tells the gene how productively to turn on, and there are differences. And of course, the transgene. We've had to edit this transgene down to fit into this capsid, and we've done that in different ways, and we'll talk about that, all three of these things today. But before we do, I do want to linger on something that was touched on in the last session, but it does bear repeating. It is important, and it's why these discussions at PPMD are important to you. Gene therapy is a one-time treatment, and of course, there's a lot of excitement in that. This is a very hopeful concept. Perhaps we have things that could be transformative for families. But it's one time as well because it can only be one time currently. That is where our science is. As you've heard in the last session, you will, get, you will be eventually immune from another treatment in the future after your first treatment. And it is very likely the case that you will be immune not merely for another treatment of the current treatment, but also of other treatments that are, that are AAV med mediated as well. Which means that if you choose Sarepta's gene therapy, you, whether you know it or not, and your physician, whether he or she knows it or not, is very likely choosing to not get Pfizer's therapy. And likewise, if you choose Pfizer's therapy, there is a real chance that you're choosing not to get Sarepta's therapy or not to get Solid's therapy. So the decisions that you're making are very important, long-term and profound ones, and I'm quite confident you must realize that, and you need information to make those decisions and make those decisions informed and meaningful, and there is a roadmap to do that, and here is, from our perspective, the roadmap that you really need to follow in evaluating therapies that you might be called upon or might have the opportunity to par participate in, particularly before they become commercially available. <clears throat> the first one, of course, is safety. What are the safety signals, both preclinically and in patients? All of us have treated patients now. What are the safety signals? Are you seeing adverse events? Are you seeing serious adverse events? Why? What is the presumed me mechanism of action for those serious adverse events? How tolerable, tolerable is the, the therapy? Are the kids thriving? Are they failing to thrive? Are they gaining in weight and height and developmental milestones? Once we know the safety, we need to know if the gene is getting to the right place. This is extremely important. One of the real questions early on was whether it was really possible to do full body infusions and get enough gene in the right place to make a difference. And there's a metric to look at this and it's called genome copies per nucleus. And I think it's important to understand that. The next thing and probably the most thing in these early days of treating patients is the amount of dystrophin you're actually making, quantifying the amount of dystrophin. And there is a way to do that, and it has been uh, available for a very long time, and it is Western blot. And there are three, three reasons, and it won't come as a surprise to anyone on this dais that we feel strongly about this. There are three, th three reasons why one should look to Western blot as the primary way to quantify dystrophin today. First, it is the accepted standard for dystrophin quantification. It is, by the way, the only standard yet ever used by the agency to approve therapies on quantification of dystrophin. It, by the way, is the only measure that actually exists in all of these studies. Every study protocol of Pfizer and Solid and, and Sarepta 
call for Western blot as a potential measure of dystrophin quantification. And third, done properly, Western blot is accurate. In fact, um, in our hands, we get about a 20%, what's called a CV. It's a measure of variance, and that's very similar to what others have seen in literature on some of these newer methods. So what we would argue strongly that those who have Western blot data, and everyone should, should freely provide them so that we can see what kind of quantification of dystrophin occurs. Now, once you've quantified the dystrophin, the next question is where is it going? It's not merely enough to know that you're making dystrophin. Is it getting to the right place? And that's immunohistochemistry. Is the dystrophin actually making its way to the muscle membrane and acting like a functional shock absorber, a structural protein, as it is intended to do? And there are two measures here in immunohistochemistry that go together to determine that, that answer. The first, of course, is dystrophin-positive fibers. Do we see some signal of dystrophin on a fiber that we can count? But the second answer is also intensity. How intense is that signal? Together, we get a complete picture. Alone, we do not. So we need both of those. We need the percentage of dystrophin-positive fibers, and we need to know how intense that signal is, which is another marker of how meaningful it is when we're counting these fibers. And of course, if there is function in all of the protocols for all of these um, studies have functional endpoints in them, these kids are actually being measured on function, we should be looking at function, although I will readily agree with Dr. Binks, we have to be somewhat careful about overanalyzing functional endpoints at this point, only because these are open label studies, these are small cohorts. Everything we see here, we need to reconfirm in larger studies, but certainly you deserve to know what signals exist from these early studies. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in our program, and just I'll, I'll focus specifically, of course, on Sarepta's program. We use a different vector. The other programs are using AAV9. We use something called RH74, and we use it for the following reasons. The first is it has a very robust affinity for muscles, at least it does in animal models. It has a relatively low level of pre-existing antibody response. As you, you heard earlier, this is a really important issue. We would love the answer to be 0%, because if it was 0%, it means everyone could get um, our, our therapy if it ultimately works. We don't see 0%, but we see about 15%, 15%. Uh, and we've looked across well over 100, um, 100 individuals so far, so we're getting pretty confident about that number which is, uh, while we'd love it to be 0%, and while we're working at ways someday to maybe knock down pre-existing neutralizing antibodies as it stands right now, it means as many as 85% of patients may be available for this, this vector, RH74. And finally, the significant difference between RH74 and, for instance, AAV9 is that, unlike AAV9, RH74 does not robustly uh, or promiscuously cross the blood-brain barrier. To remind us, the blood-brain barrier is the thing that we all have that as stuff circulates in our body, it protects us by filtering out things that would otherwise go into the central nervous system and the brain, things like infectious agents. AAV9 promiscuously crosses the blood-brain barrier, RH74 does not. Now, you may know that there is a need for dystrophin in the brain, but make no mistake, none of these constructs, none of them, will turn on in the brain. There is no value whatsoever for having any of these constructs in your CNS or in your brain, so we have chosen RH74 as our vector. We use a different promoter. The other promoters are these miniaturized CK promoters. We use a modified version of that, which is called MHCK7, a heavy chain promoter, and there are three reasons for that. The first is that it was engineered specifically for muscular dystrophy. The second is that it shows great specificity for skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and the diaphragm. And the third reason is this. It was explicitly designed to enhance expression in the cardiac muscle. And in animal models, it does that. So in addition to being generally more productive than other MCK promoters, it actually shows greater expression even in the cardiac muscle, about 120% of whatever we see in the skeletal muscle. And I don't need to remind anyone in this room of the value of protecting the heart in children and young men who are living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Finally, let's talk about how um, we designed, and when I say we, I, I'm taking a lot of credit that I don't uh, have the right to take, but, but how Dr. Luis Rodino Claypack, our head of gene therapy, designed the particular construct that we're using today. 
What we're looking at here are three things. On the far left of your screen is a full-length dystrophin. And what you can see in full-length dystrophin is, is that it acts like a structural protein. It binds to the actin binding site through these spectrin repeats that are called spectrin repeats one, two, and three. It binds to the sarcolemma or the muscle membrane, and then it attaches to the dystrophin-associated protein, being a sort of anchor structural protein and shock absorber for the muscle. What we see in the center is a form of microdystrophin. And what's fascinating about this microdystrophin is that it was designed by no one. In fact, it was designed by nature. This is an interesting issue. There was a 61-year-old man who walked into a doctor's office, and I'd like to repeat that again, he walked into a doctor's office because he's ambulatory. He was genotyped, and lo and behold, because of his mutation, he had a form of microdystrophin, a greatly truncated dystrophin. And of course, he's in his 60s and he's walking. It was obviously functional. And you can see why in the center, it attaches to the active actin binding site. It, it, it maintains spectrum repeats one, two, and three and anchored to the sarcolemma and it attached to the dystrophin associated protein comp complex. And that is exactly what Dr. Luis Rodino Claypack and her team, at the time at Nationwide before she moved over to Sarepta, did. They first started with this as a template and then they began empirically looking at ways to modify this, this structure to continue to fit into this capsid or vector, but still remain functional. And that's why, as you'll see on the far right, we have our current construct, which is very similar to that 61-year-old ambulatory patient. So this is what we have in animal models before I move on to our human, um, our, our first four uh, children that have been dosed. What you see in our animal models is that at, our, at the mid-dose, the 2 times 10 to the 14th dose, dose using our titer, we get great expression across all of the muscles that we looked at. And in fact, there's an additional muscle that's not here, but if it was here, it would be even greater, which is the cardiac muscle. As I, as I have said, we get about 120% greater expression even in the cardiac muscle. But the good news is we get great coverage and great expression across all of the muscles that we look at in animal models, that's really important to, to children that are getting dosed in these trials. It means that we don't have to take 15 biopsies to prove that we're getting expression everywhere. If we take expression in one muscle, in our case it's the gastroc, and we see great expression, we presume that we'll be seeing great expression everywhere and we'll be seeing enhanced expression in, um, in the heart. So let's talk about the data that we've seen today. This, this is data that has been um, reviewed at medical meetings in the past. That's why I'm allowed to give it as opposed to Dr. Luis Rodino Claypack or our great partner, Dr. Jerry Mendel. But I'll walk through this because um, I, I think it's important for everyone to see. And then we'll talk about next steps. To remind you, our first trial, our first cohort proof of concept trial was four patients. They're four to seven years old. The primary endpoint, it won't surprise you, is safety. Safety is, of course, the first thing we need to think about, but we've taken tons of other measures, biomarkers, functional measures, and the like, and I'll review that with, with you today. So we said safety is important. Here are the safety results from our first four-patient cohort. The first thing to know is there were no serious adverse events in the study to date. Three of the, the patients had elevated liver enzymes. The liver is a preferred place for the vector to go, so it, it, it is becoming unsurprising that we get elevated liver enzymes in connection with these full body infusions, but they rapidly responded to increases in steroids, rapidly returned to baseline. This appears to be quite manageable. Uh, the subjects had very transient and mild nausea that was coincident with an increase in steroids, but all of it resolved quickly within a week. There were no decreases in any of the patients in platelet counts, and we look often for platelet count reductions. There have been none. There is no indication of any kind of any kind of complement activation. There's been no indications of a failure to thrive in these patients, or said another way, these patients are thriving. All of these kids are gaining in height. All of these kids are, are gaining correspondingly in weight. All of these kids are hitting developmental milestones, and there were no other clinically significant laboratory findings. So I said we need to find out if the gene is getting to the right place, and the good news is that it is. Across the four patients, we see a mean 3.3 copies for every nucleus, which is a brilliant answer, frankly. We're very excited about this. So the gene's getting to the right place. 
Now the question is, are we making any dystrophin? Does that gene make dystrophin, and does it make dystrophin in amounts that might matter? And the good news is, using Western blot, we're making, in these first four, four kids, um, a very significant amount of dystrophin. In fact, it is about 96% of normal adjusted for fat and fibrotic tissue. So really exciting uh, in the first four patients, the, the amount of dystrophin that's being made from a quantitative perspective. But of course, the next question is, that's great, we're making dystrophin. Is it getting to the right place? Is it getting to the muscle membrane? And the great news is that it is. So let me explain what we're looking at here across all four patients. On the far left, that thing that's called normal control, that's an age-matched patient that doesn't, have, um, that doesn't have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And all of the red that you're seeing right there, that is um, dystrophin properly localized to the, to the sarcolemma, acting like the functional protein that it's supposed to be acting like, acting like a shock absorber for the muscle. When we go to the right, those four patients, along the top, that's pre-treatment. So it will come as no surprise, it is all you know, essentially inky blackness. Now, if we magnified that, you might see some dystrophin there. But as you can see there, you basically see no dystrophin at all. OK, great. Um, and then we look at below, and there's post-treatment. And all of the red that you're seeing below is dystrophin properly localized to the sarcolemma or the muscle membrane where it needs to be if it's going to act functionally as a shock absorber and protect this muscle while it moves. And then the numbers. So the number for dystrophin-positive fibers is 81%. I will remind you, you can only have 100%. So we're getting up to the top of what is possible here. And intensity, which as I've mentioned before, is an extraordinarily important metric. We can't simply look at dystrophin-positive fibers on their own, is 96%, where 100% would be that patient on the far left. So really strong results so far in the first four patient cohort in the Sarepta study. And here's a summary of uh, indications of functionality, and let me explain what we're looking at. That purple line is creatine kinase, or CK levels. I think everyone in the room understands that CK is the enzyme that's released by the muscle when it is being damaged, and across the study, these kids had a really precipitous drop in CK in the first 90 days, and even though they're increasing in activity, that uh, CK level is remaining low over the entire nine-month period. And that yellow line is increase in function, and we're using North Star ambulatory assessment, which is a composite function, and all four of these kids are gaining function, and they're gaining functions in ways that cannot possibly be explained by natural history. Now, I will say again what was said earlier. We want to be careful about this. This is open label. These are just four children. It is very easy to overinterpret or overanalyze data, but it is certainly at least encouraging that we're seeing such positive signals in our first four patients. So here are our next steps. That was trial one, four patients. The next thing we needed to do was start a placebo-controlled trial. We have a 24-patient placebo-controlled trial with Dr. Jerry Mandel at Nationwide Children's Hospital. At the beginning of this week, we had dosed 23 patients. What time is it right now? Five of. It is very likely the case that our 24th patient, who will clearly be dosed today, is being dosed even as we speak. So the good news is, by the close of day, and maybe even by the time I'm done talking, if I'll ever stop, our 24th patient will have been dosed, and things are going very well right now. There are no untoward signals of any kind so far, although I will remind you it's a placebo-controlled and blinded study, so we won't get efficacy on that until next year. The next thing we need to do is start what we call the commercial supply trial. That is using our commercial process that we're developing, we need to start an even larger trial. That's going to be a multi-site, multi-center trial, multi-country trial. Um, and we're going to start that at the end of this year, and it'll be a much larger trial as well. And here are our broad goals for the therapy and for the trial. So first understand, we don't intend to create a treatment for four to seven-year-olds. We intend to a, create a treatment that not only gets approved for, but gets access for all age ranges. So in the next trial, we will have an arm for non-ambulatory patients. That is a certainty. 
We are expanding the DMD genetic uh, mutation ranges so that we are going to cover in the next trial to the fullest extent possible all genetic mutations in the trial. We're not going to have limitations um, along those lines so long as the science will allow us to do that, and it looks like it will. And the third thing, although not on this page you need to know, is we're not trying to design a therapy that might treat patients in the United States. We're trying to design a therapy that can benefit families across the globe, so our, our plans, our studies, our ambition is to bring this therapy everywhere around the world that patients might benefit from it, assuming that our trials bear out. This is our goal. Our goal, and it's an audacious one and an ambitious one, we would love to develop life-changing therapies that could be transformative for 100% of children and young men who are living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But I want to be clear about this. I can't make you a promise today that we're going to achieve that. We can't do that. We have to wait for the data and the science to lead us in that direction, as, as positive our, as our early signals may be. The data is going to inform us. But I can make some promises, and I will. The first thing I can promise you is that Sarepta will not um, reduce its, its mission. It will not reduce its passion and its urgency in this fight. I can promise you that we will apply the best science and the best scientists that we can find in attacking Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I can promise you that along this journey, everyone at Sarepta, myself included, will approach you with authenticity and complete transparency. And I promise you, absolutely promise you, that we will not give up on this fight or up on you. So thank you very much. So I uh, would like to open it up to questions and hopefully people will take advantage of an opportunity to talk to these companies. I had one question which was uh, in the trial design, uh, what kind of long-term follow-up do you have? How long is that intended to go? And uh, what kind of follow-up are you doing? I'll start, we're doing multi-year follow-up on these kids. Uh, so the Pfizer trial is a one-year follow-up with a four-year extension within the same pro protocol, so five, five years altogether. Similarly, this will be done in a separate mechanism than the current protocol, but yes, similar as guided by regulatory uh, requirements for at least five years. I see there are uh, people lining up at the microphone, so if you'll introduce yourself uh, and pose your question. Yes, hello, my name is Terry Ellsworth. My son is Billy. And I have a question for Dr. Binks. Um, <clears throat> for me, when I have um, decided and contemplated which trials to enroll my son in, my number one concern and still is, is safety. Any surveys that I've been in or focus groups, that's always been my concern. So what do you think is causing your side effects? Do you think it's the AAV9? or do you think it's something unique to your particular product? No, it's a great question, and obviously it's critically important. Um, so there was, there was one, one event in the six boys uh, treated uh, that we uh, are starting to understand. We believe it's related to an exaggerated immune response, a slightly greater immune response, same immune response that it occurs in every person treated. Um, we can't say at this point that it has anything to do with uh, AAV9 or the age of the boy or pre-existing uh, immunological features or genetic features. We're looking into a number of those possibilities. Um, but what we can do and what we have done is make changes to the uh, protocol and procedures to ensure that uh, should we get to a point where there is a similar magnitude of of immune response or there's any evidence of complement activation that we can act much more quickly to prevent the kind of uh, 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 tissue injury that we, uh, we saw in that, that individual. Okay, thank you. And really quickly, um, another thing that parents find very interesting are CK levels. What kind of drops have you noticed in the first three months? So, so we've seen drops from baseline uh, uh, two to three months, around 80 to 85 percent. Um, 
where we haven't reported it here partly because of lack of time and we thought the functional data were more important to uh, focus on. Um, and we're not quite sure what it means ultimately. Um, you know, there is some evidence that uh, as the observation goes on, that levels start to rise. How uh, the CK level really relates to long-term functional benefit is a bit of an unknown. But we've seen uh, those uh, CK reductions, as we saw in animal models, in, uh, in both, the, the both dose cohorts. It was more marked in the higher dose cohort. OK, thank you. Uh, I guess we can alternate microphones. Hi, I'm Dana Edwards. I'm the mom of Tanner, who's 15. And first off, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, we've come so far in research in the past 10 years. It blows my mind. Thank you to Solid for taking on ambulatory. I love that. But um, what is the time frame to have non-ambulatory patients on drug? Because time isn't on our side. So how long are like we looking far out? My son is clearly not ambulatory But how far out are you guys? I'll start that, if you don't mind. So, uh, as I said, we want to get our next study going if, by the end of the year, if at all possible. There's a lot of work to be done to get that to happen. That's our goal. And then our goal in that study is to have an arm for non-ambulatory patients. So it is limited only by our ability to get everything in order and start the trial by the end of this year. Yeah, I think it should be reversed, honestly. No. Anyway, um, and then I wanted to ask Solid uh, today, why wasn't there any um, data or... Um, you know, anything recapped from? I mean, from our yeah. experience so far, a lot of I don't know if you like you can or, you know. I mean, there's, there's certain aspects of the study that have been disclosed publicly before. We didn't um, go over those again, but just kind of gave an update of where we are now. The progress we have with our 2E14, our higher dose cohort, and what our plans are for, for moving forward. And those data we are planning to make available, you know, broadly to the community by later this year. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Jen McNary. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions for uh, Dr. Binks. Um, first, on efficacy, I know that you showed uh, um, the uh, dystrophin uh, production, but I wondered if you had any more information on the positive fibers, um, because we know from experience that it's important um, what percentage of those fibers are positive. So, um, the, in the higher dose cohort, we saw 69% of positive fibers in terms of the change from baseline. <clears throat> Can you uh, talk a little bit about the intensity of those fibers, though, within each individual? Um, not in exactly the same way as my colleague uh, uh, Sarepta presented. Um, the, the intensity covers a wide range. Um, but uh, I, I don't have a way of referring that to, uh, to the normal uh, in terms of our numbers. The concentration of dystrophin uh, is a, a, a more accurate measure of uh, the amount of protein production. Um, so so the, it, it's important that we have uh, two measures, one looking at distribution of transduction and the other at the total level of dystrophin protein that is uh, present in the muscle. So I hadn't heard about this concentration before. Can you, do you mind explaining that quickly about what, why that's more important? Well, it's just a, 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 an absolute measure of the amount of dystrophin in the muscle biopsy without referring to percent normal. The issue with percent normal is that normal is extremely variable. Um, so we can look at uh, a mean of normal, and we've taken a sample of 20, uh, a pool of 20 normal muscle biopsies. Um, but, but the actual measured concentration uh, is, is a, an important and measurable parameter. So it's, it's a, a, protein, a concentration of uh, the, the dystrophin protein that's, that's in the biopsy. It, it just avoids this approximation step to <coughs> normal. And, and, and that's its real value, I think. Okay, and I just had one other question about the weight loss. I hadn't seen that before in any study, so it's very interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the base weight and uh, age of the patients and then how long it took them to get back to their normal weight? 
so I think associated with the nausea and vomiting, uh, there, were, there were some transient weight loss uh, seen in, in those individuals, um, but it returned to normal within weeks. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we move to stage yeah. left. Hi, uh, my name is Elena Etienne. I have a six-year-old son with Duchenne, and I have a question. First of all, I want to thank you all for all your hard work and dedication. Uh, give us so much hope. And my question to Mr. Ingram. Um, yesterday we watched some uh, presentation about optimizing trial designs. And uh, as a parent of a child who would greatly benefit from gene therapy, I'm very interested to get enrolled my child into your trial, into your commercial grade trial. But uh, placebo arm is the biggest concern for me because given uh, suppressed immune system, increasing suppression, steroids, uh, a chances to get antibodies developed in the, you know, during the wait, uh, waiting period, um, or invasive procedures during the trial, and in the end you're not going to get any treatment. Uh, my question is, do you have any plans on mitigating the placebo arm problem in a commercial grade? trial given uh, you will have placebo data from ongoing trial with 24 patients and natural history data which was recently actually uh, posted by PPMD. Uh, and would it be more ethical to eliminate placebo arm and don't put us through that, us and our kids through that burden I to mean, go through all that stuff? This is a great question. I can tell you, I hope I'm not revealing too much when I tell you you're well represented by um, PPMD and Pat Furlong who have, have challenged um, a number of times this view that we need to use a placebo-controlled trial for these gene therapies. Let, let me explain why we do. We do it because of this passion to get kids on therapy. We have learned, frankly, the hard way um, that if we don't have strong evidence for payers, never mind Remember, there are two things we all have to get done to get these kids treated. Well, three things. First, we have to prove that the therapies work, that they're safe and effective, and that they're robust. Okay? Then we have to get them approved by agencies. And then we have to get payers to be willing to um, lean in and to get kids on these therapies and to get access to these therapies across these kids. And we've learned the hard way that that last step is a very, often a very challenging step, that, it, that, that payers will... If I can be real direct, they will find any way they can to avoid access at times. At least that's the way it feels. I'm probably extremely biased, as I'm sure many people who are who have been dealing with these payers on, be, on behalf of patients as well. And we've made the decision painfully, because I agree with you, I think it is a very difficult ethical struggle to decide whether it's appropriate to put a degenerating child on a placebo trial. But we looked at it and said, in aggregate, if all these kids will get therapy, by the way. I want to be clear. I hope everyone understands that. If, if there's a, kid in a, a child in a placebo trial, at the end of one year, they will be made, the, the therapy will be made available to them, and they will get therapy as well. So essentially what we're talking about for every child in the study is, uh, is you'll either get it, you either get it now or you get it in 12 months. And as an example, in our 24 patients trial, what it means is there are 24 kids. 12 of them, we don't know yet which 12, 12 of them will have received the therapy immediately. And 12 of them will have received the therapy 12 months later, but all 24 of them will have received the therapy long before, hopefully not that long before, but you know, some period of time before the rest of the, the community would have, have the availability. And by the time we got done with all of this, those, those kids would, if the therapy works, have benefited from the therapy. And the ability to get other kids rapidly on this therapy, these kids that are degenerating, would be rapid as well. And so that was the metric that we used. It was not an easy decision. It came with a lot of um, debate. It came with a lot of discussion with patient advocacy. It came with a lot of pushback from patient advocacy who you know, understand the problems of placebo-controlled trials. But that's why we're doing what we're doing. And we think in the, in the end, we're convinced that's the best answer for, for um, families. Uh, is it the possibility to increase the ratio, maybe three to one, 
We're, we're looking Something at like that. that. That's a really good question as well, and we're looking carefully at that. The current trial, because it is so, you know, frankly, it is a modestly sized trial, is one to one. If we can ramp this up, and if we can do the stats, and if the statistics tell us that we can, um, we can get across the finish line and, and show statistical significance and do a different ratio, then certainly we would look at that as well. Because the bur burden on patients is something we're constantly thinking about, and these trials, um, these trials are an enormous burden on families as well. So we're trying to find ways to minimize that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, so we'd like to move over to this side, but I'd like to ask people to, uh, I guess, at this point, stop lining up because we're going into the break time, uh, but we want to get as many questions as we can. So, Anessa, please. Yes, uh, Anessa Faisenfeld. My son Tyler is 19. So I, I understand the payer piece in placebo, but I guess I, I would like to understand the rationale in um, placebo when it, it when it comes to the patients who are being dosed. They're obviously um, showing symptoms, the nausea, vomiting. So when you, as a parent, when you have a, 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 a son who's being dosed. Um, with placebo, and we see that they aren't um, developing those symptoms. I, I guess I'm trying to understand where, where is that rationale coming for? Is, is FDA requiring um, us to have that placebo arm? Is there, is there mm. more to it than just the payer piece? Well, the, well, a couple things. There's a lot to unpack in here. So first of all, I don't want to lean and blame the FDA for our decisions regarding a placebo-controlled trial. This, is a, this was a choice, so we chose it, and if you're if you, if you want to challenge someone, you should challenge us, but we really do believe we've made the choice that in, in our assessment, based on our experience, and we have a lot of experience now dealing with um, regulatory agencies and then secondarily payers uh, is important, we've made this choice. Now, I would like to say one other thing on that, though. Let's go past the FDA. You know, uh, let me give an example of a therapy. We have a therapy right now, Xandas 51 at Teplerson. My view, it's creating great, great benefit to those patients who have it um, in the United States. It, um, we have not been able to get it approved in Europe. And if one wonders why we haven't been able to get it approved, you can see the briefing documents and the responsive documents from the CHMP, the, the, the group that votes on it. And what you'll see is not um, an enormous amount of skepticism about whether it works, but an enormous pushback because we didn't do a placebo-controlled trial. I think if you did a word search for the term placebo-controlled trial in their response, you'd probably get it a hundred times. So it, it became resonating that if our goal is to get this therapy everywhere, we're going to have to have a trial that's sufficiently robust that it works for everyone, um, number one. N number two, you raised a really interesting point about essentially the ability to blind a trial, right? There are limitations. The, the one thing I will say, the good news with our trial is while in our early, for instance, in our trial, we see mild nausea in a few kids, it's associated with the fact, it's right, it's, it is completely coincident with them getting on steroids, these are young kids. So we're seeing some very mild nausea that resolves very rapidly. Generally speaking, this therapy has been very, very well tolerated in these kids. And so I don't think there's a concern about functional unblinding. I know this is a challenge. We're continuing to look at it for our next trial. I am not gonna commit in advance that we wouldn't use a placebo trial. I frankly am leaning in the direction of a placebo trial, so I don't wanna mislead people. But I, as, as much as that may seem like a, a burden, I, there is a, you know, talk to families who are on Exondus 51 that have non-ambulatory kids, as an example, and talk to them about the battle that it is constantly, like typically every six months, to continue to get access to, to that therapy. If we have a therapy that is as profound and transformative as we at least hope that it is, and that's really all I can say now, if we have that, we need, to con we need to be convinced that we've done everything in our power, that when that therapy is finally approved by a regulatory agency, we can bring that to patients and we don't find ourselves running up against the brick wall of payers who claim that we don't have sufficient information to justify getting every age range on that therapy. And that's one of the things that pushes us to a placebo trial. And this is a one year, at 48 weeks, all patients will have the opportunity to get on active therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Jeff Bigelow. My son Henry is, he just turned nine. And we're kind of in this awkward spot where he's, um, 
lost ambul- he's losing ambulation quickly. Sorry, I wasn't planning to do this. So. Um, and he has early heart involvement. And so the heart piece has become really important. And so I'm just wondering, how do you plan to measure the effects on the heart? And uh, I know Sarepta talked specifically about a heart promoter. And uh, for the other companies, Pfizer and Solid, do you have any evidence or belief? Or how do you um, measure whether the heart is also going to be helped? Am I? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, that we include, this is something we're paying tremendous attention to because it's so impactful for the health of, of Duchenne patients. Um, we're using two ways to look at heart function. One is the standard echocardiogram, kind of put the probe on a kind of an ultrasound based assessment. But for the older patients who are able to tolerate sitting in an MRI scanner, we're also doing a cardiac MRI. So following this, this very closely, as well as EC, you know, EC, electrocardiogram and that kind of thing routinely as well. And just from the point of view of Pfizer, our uh, preclinical models showed very clearly uh, not only that there was uh, transduction, expression of dystrophin in the heart, uh, but that there were improvements in function in a rat uh, MDX model of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And likewise, we're monitoring uh, through the five-year period on ejection fraction uh, and uh, other cardiac biomarkers. And the, the, likewise, I'll say, as I mentioned in my presentation, one of the reasons that we chose this MHCK7 promoter was that it was explicitly designed to actually overexpress in cardiac muscle. So when I show you the results of those, that dystrophin production in, um, in a gastroc muscle, I can't show you it in a heart, obviously, uh, for, for the actual children, but our animal models would suggest that we're getting 120% of that in the cardiac muscles, so it ought to be um, it ought to be protective, and we're certainly looking in the next study at ways to to be able to um, identify that early as possible. So, so the the good news is that we are certainly of the view that at least the the therapy profile ought to benefit the heart. We've seen cardiac expression in our animal models in the uh, preclinical setting as well. Thank you, and I just also, I'm hoping that nine-year-old ambulatory boys will be not excluded. If he becomes non-ambulatory at nine or 10, that the ambulatory cutoff isn't like 12 years older, you know, trying to make sure that there's boys who don't fall into these weird gaps where our boy currently is. Yeah. We're, we're still working on the exact age range protocols. Our goal is to span enough ages that we are confident that we'll get approved and get access for all, all kids. The one thing I'd say is, you know, I think they're, for families that are willing to accept the risk, I know a lot of folks want to be in these trials and I understand that. And that's why, as I said earlier, I think getting the right kinds of information to make those decisions is important. Our uh, more significant even than that for us is moving as fast as possible so that this therapy is available, not merely for um, children that um, are able to be in a trial, but that we can get this out to all children and young men who are living today with, um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to correct a response I made to a question about weight loss. I think there was a misunderstanding between uh, the term anorexia on the slide and weight loss. Anorexia really is just loss of appetite. Um, and in fact, we haven't seen any weight loss uh, in any of the boys. Uh, we saw it in, in some uh, preclinical uh, studies, but not, uh, not in the clinic. So I just wanted to set the record straight. Apologies. And so these would be the last three questions. And if I could ask two, please be concise if you can. OK. Um, let me just say I was hoping I would get my question out before the camera got over here. but. <laughs> Um, my name is Deb Jensen. I have two daughters with Duchesne. They're identical twins. They're nine years old. Um, Mr. Ingram, you, made, you talked about how you're going to be starting this trial later this year that would be much more inclusive. Yeah. And then at the end of your talk, you made a very moving statement about making this available to 100% of patients with Duchesne. Yes. Um, so my question is, um, first of all, have you thought about enrolling girls in this upcoming trial? Um, if not, can you think about it? Um, and finally, if 
this is not tested in girls, really a question for all of you. If this is not tested in girls, is this something that girls can have access to if it's never tested? So a couple, couple thoughts on that. First of all, we haven't thought about girls in our next study. And, and it is very easy for me to constantly talk about young boys and uh, young men and, and boys and forget that there are manifesting carriers out there. And I apologize for, for that miss. We haven't thought about girls. We can think about girls. I'm going to tell you the probability is low that we'd be able to do that. We've got to pick the, essentially the precious material that we have to get the study as robust as possible to not get enough st standard deviation in a, tr in a study. Like, let me be very clear. One of the concerns one has with clinical trials is this, so we're clear. The, the most tragic thing that to have is a brilliant therapy that, that is subject to a trial that is designed poorly and ends up getting a false negative, right? That, that is ultimate tragedy after all this great work. So the first thing we've got to do is make sure that we've designed a trial that um, shows the right statistical significance on function and that no regulator puts up any um, argument about the therapy and we get it approved and then we get access. So I, I will be honest with you, and while you know, maybe there is an arm that we can think about and we've not thought about it at all, and I'll take it back to my colleagues, I think the probability may be low. Mechanistically, from a mechanism of action perspective, there is no explaining at all why a therapy that would benefit um, young boys and young men wouldn't benefit um, girls and women who are manifesting carriers. So I can tell you, I, I believe that this, that this should be applicable across you know, gender. And I, I can tell you that I believe that payers ought to give access across gender. I can tell you with our current therapy, Exondis, we get girls on a study. We had a very, we've got the number of girls who are manifesting carriers who are Exxon 51 amenable who have been on uh, therapy. And I can promise you, and I'm, I know this may sound like fluff and it's not, we'll fight like mad to ensure that when we get this therapy approved, that everyone gets on it, including manifest, uh, manifest carriers, manifesting carriers. Thank you. I appreciate that. If I may just, just make one comment, because what you said about getting the approval and having the least variability possible in your trial, um, a lot of people have said that to me. I don't know how many companies I've talked to about getting girls in trials. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I just want to comment. I know it's really out of your control. It's really more the FDA. Um, but obviously with boys, there's variability in, yeah. in how they're affected, um, just like there is with girls. So in a case where you have a girl yeah. that is within that variability that boys have, um, like at least one of my daughters <coughs> has, um, it just, to me, it just really doesn't make sense that somebody should be excluded just because they're a girl. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll at least give you my word that I'll take this back to the team and we'll consider what we do about this. I, we have, I have literally not considered this particular issue before today. I just don't want to give you false hope. Thank you very much. Thanks I appreciate that. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Kate Vanderweel. I have a six-year-old son. And um, my question is a little bit more broad, and, or not broad, but general. Just back to basics. Can you talk about exclusion criteria a little bit more? And if mutation-specific mm. exclusions are in place for your trials? So from the Sarepta study, we require out-of-frame mutations, um, but there's no other genetic exclusion as long as the diagnosis. Any, I, I'll... What did, I, did I? Oh, yeah, I'm from Pfizer, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were going to reveal at the end of the study. He's coming to work for us. You're hired. <laughs> um, there you go. Any We're all power. one. That's right. <laughs> Kumbaya. <laughs> uh, at the, so for this, the current Sarepta studies, um, out of an abundance of caution, for the current one, the 24 patient one that's already been, I think by now all 24 patients have been dosed, I, I am strongly of the opinion. Um, I'll keep talking until he's, until he's fully infused. Um, we, had, we do have some exclusions and mutations. Some of the the later mutations and some of the earlier mutations, I think 18 and below, had been excluded and it was really out of an abundance of caution, a, a concern or belief that perhaps there might be immune responses in those ranges. We've done a lot of work since then. We are, we are um, getting to a view, first of all, we're certainly getting to a view that that 
the broad exclusions that we had are not actually necessary or appropriate or even founded on, uh, you know, really founded well on um, a risk-oriented um, perspective. And it may very well be the case, I think it's highly likely by the time we get to the next study that um, we won't have exclusions for, on, uh, for mutations on that basis. There may be a couple of exclusions relating to mutations that are, that are, that have a significantly different phenotype, but there aren't many of those, and that would be the only kind of thing we would look at, just to make sure that we didn't have a, um, an issue in the trial from a, from a sort of a standard deviation perspective. Oh, I didn't know if Solid was going to answer that one. Um, I'm Mindy Cameron. I have a 17-year-old son, um, non-ambulatory. So two questions, quick questions. Pfizer, are you planning a, a non-ambulatory study? We are. Um, the timing isn't set and the protocol isn't uh, finalized, but uh, it will, will start after the, the uh, pivotal uh, ambulatory study. Thanks. And Sarepta, um, have you thought about trial design for your non-ambulatory? And is it, it just, is it going to be dose escalation or is it going to be placebo? Do you know yet? Well, but by do, dose, we're not dose escalating. So okay. is it, is not, it stands in the non-ambulatory, right? Yeah, for non-ambulatory or ambulatory, not dose escalating, right? Okay. Um, and then for the study, we're still working on the design itself. There is a real chance that it's placebo controlled but we need to look at it carefully with non-ambulatory. There are particular um, issues and particular ethical issues as it relates to the non-ambulatory kids and we need to think hard about that. So don't, you know, it's not time yet to, to, to lobby for, for that because we need to work, do some more work. Um, and then we're, we're going to look at functional measures. There are a lot of really interesting functional measures. One of the things that we've done a lot of work on over the last few years is pulmonary function. We have some really, um, impressive data on uh, pulmonary function and pulmonary function uh, predicted, um, FEC predicted in these patients and we think that there's a real chance that that might be a good metric that we can use and hopefully use if we do a robust enough trial mm -hmm. in the non-ambulatory patients, do one that where we can see a difference if our, if our therapy is sufficiently um, um, transformative in a year and that's, that's one of the things we're looking Would at. Would a cardiac endpoint be relevant because maybe since it's more, so so much more effective in the heart, yeah. could you use less product to get good efficacy in the heart? So we're looking at all of those interesting issues. The one question we have to look carefully at is is whether you can see that whether you can actually tease the difference out in 12 months. You know, and we're making a lot of difficult decisions based on small data sets. We haven't even dosed non-ambulatory patients yet, as you as you well know. So we have to look at all of those issues before we. Okay, um, thanks. Before we make a decision. Thank you so much. Hey, I would really uh, like to thank the panelists and presenters for terrific presentations, very great information, very good questions, and PPMD for providing this terrific forum for people. Uh, and I believe that Ryan has polling questions, so stay where everyone is. And thank you. Thank you. So um, just some housekeeping. We're going to move right on through. There is some drinks outside, coffee break, if you need it, but come back in. Families, I have two polling questions. I'm also going to invite the next panel up right now to get yourself situated so we can move right on through the program, OK? OK. So we're going to put up the next two polling questions. I see everyone's so excited as they run out of the room and they don't care about my polling questions. So, for the five of you who remained, <laughs> what comes to mind when you hear the words gene therapy? What's that? We're already going, we're already going. Yeah. So anyone who's doing the polling questions, what are the words that come to mind when you hear the words gene therapy? This is like the worst time to do these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. I think that means, oh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. That's hope. We see hope being the primary word that's coming out. 
All right, thank you everyone who did participate in this.